Welcome back to this special edition of Rural America Live featuring Randy Dowdy and his great accomplishment this year of 190 bushel soybeans. We are joined now by Brian Hashemeyer, Director of Discovery and Innovation with Brandt. Well, Brian, thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for having me. All right, so Randy, we wanted to talk a little about fertility with you because I think everybody's wondering, all right, 190 bushel soybeans, how do you get there when it comes to fertility? Can you tell us just a little bit in general, what are you doing on your farm? Well, we've got a long history of chicken litter and using chicken litter as a base. Um, we pull soil samples every year. We pull those soil samples and then we pull tissue samples throughout the season to help us understanding you know, it, it matters what you have applied in the soil and it matters what you have there, but really all that matters is what's in the plant. So we use tissue samples to, to kind of coach us and to tell us, do we have what we think we, we should in the plant at any given time. Okay, so chicken litter, are you applying that in the fall or in the spring? It depends on when we can purchase it. Um, yep. Quite often, um, you know, about every 60 days there will be a grow out. Sometimes they'll kick out each time. Um, sometimes it may be three grow outs. So it depends on when we can get yeah. it. Um, it's not a commodity necessarily that we can rely on every three months or five yeah. months. So Now because of your light soil, I assume you can't put a lot of commercial fertilizer out there in advance, otherwise you're going to lose it so quickly. Is that part of the reason why you do so much with foliar feeding? Yeah. Um, when you buy stuff in a jug, number one, it, it's a, quite often a stimulant, but you know your, your cost breaker can go up, but more often than not, we need more elemental pan, pounds. Um, our big heavy lifting goes with soil applied fertility, and we use those you know, micronutrients and the different foliar products to help correct and get plants back in balance. And we use tissue samples to figure out what's out of balance. So what led you then to using some of the brand products? Well, uh, I guess it goes back to Glenn Roundtree years ago. Um, he was a, a guy that was in friends with Dave Hula and his brother worked for Brandt. And um, then I met Catherine, our local Brandt dealer, and I asked a lot of questions. And Catherine um, may not have known all the answers, but she could find me an answer as fast as she could. And I, I found that to be very rewarding. And quite often, um, you know, there are a lot of people that sell products, but I have learned that not all products are created equal. And it didn't take me long when I went to the Brandt facility to do my homework and see how the products were being made and discovered and that not all these products are created equal. And when you meet people like Ed Corrigan and Brian Hatchmeyer and you meet them and you talk to them, you realize just like we did with Josh a few minutes ago, they know some things that we really don't. And Dave Hula encouraged me to surround myself with smart people. And that's part of what we've done with Brandt. All right, so Brian, Randy has talked to us a lot about his use of your product, Smart BMO, on his soybeans, and that helped him get the world record yield. So what's different about that compared to anything else that's out there? Well, what's different about it is in the plant, boron binds to the cell walls. In fact, 80% of the boron in a plant is bound to a cell wall structure. And that's important because once it's bound to that cell wall, it doesn't move and the plant continuously needs boron during the growing season. So, so unlike other nutrients where the plant can remobilize it, it can't do that for boron. And it also makes it really difficult to deliver the boron properly. And we spend a lot of time focusing on to make sure that that boron moves and is there when, when it's needed. Yeah, so, you know, so, Brandy, you talk about this a lot, that you're just continuously delivering boron. You've got light soils, you can't hold a lot of boron. You've got to deliver and you've got to have something plant available. And I let tissue samples guide me. I mean, it's, we, we, have a, we had a good old fashioned swag um, in the beginning of where levels needed to be. And um, as we've been educated in pulling tissue samples and comparing it to yield, we've discovered that there are certain levels we need to maintain. And um, one of the great products that, that I've found is the Smart BMO is simply because when we apply it, I mean, we can see it get into the tissue samples and we can see how long it takes to get into that plant and we can see how long it lasts. And we've been doing this for years and it just, it has set itself above and beyond what other products I've seen that are similar. So with the Smart BMO, there's molybdenum in there too. What's the advantage of having that in there, Brian? So molly really helps with nitrogen utilization. There's two enzymes in the plant that require molly to function, and both those enzymes are directly involved with nitrogen assimilation. 
And most of the time, if you see a moly deficiency, it looks a lot like a nitrogen deficiency. And when you're trying to grow 190 bushel beans, getting every pound of nitrogen <laughs> is pretty darn important. So for that's, free. yeah, for free, really that's a right. lot less than it costs for nitrogen. So, and for what it costs to put moly out, the ROI is there pretty easily. Now, let me ask you this question a little bit, because I'm trying to learn from Randy and figure out what I can do to increase yield, but I farm in a different area of the country. We have higher soil pHs. He's dealing a lot of times with some lower soil pHs. Right. So molybdenum is a little bit more available in high pH soil. Are you still getting pretty good response out of the smart BMO, even in some of the higher pH areas in the northern part of the United States? We're seeing pretty consistent response. Some of that's based on how you manage your crop. If you're managing for 50 bushel beans, the response probably isn't as great as you're managing for 80 or 190 yeah. bushels. But yeah, it's pretty consistent response, particularly on legume crops, which require a lot of molly. All right, so Randy, talk to us a little about the timing. I mean, when are you usually spraying that particular thing, the, the boron and the molly? Is it almost always the same? You said tissue samples are guiding, but do you see certain stages where you start running Man, short? Every year is different. I mean, how much rain have you had? I mean, how much sunlight have you had? Um, how much heat have you had? I mean, these crops progress and things just change. It is a, it, everybody's looking for a magic silver bullet and it just doesn't work that way. We, we just have to be a student of that crop, have data to make better decisions with. And for me, um, the, the dry molly, um, we have not used that approach. We've done it with foliar. We have to make applications across the field a lot simply because of the fact that quite often we have worm pressure. Yeah. And with that worm pressure, we have to have something that that, we have to have application and that worm has to eat that leaf. So what we will quite often do is we have a tank mix partner, we're making a trip across the field, we know the benefits, we know it pays, we throw it in. So you're kind of handling your N, P, and K for the most part with the chicken litter, and then you come with some of these other and brand micros. products. Yeah. yeah, and micros. Yep, uh, yeah, and some micros, but you're hitting a lot more of these micros. Like here it's uh, boron and molybdenum. You've used a couple other brand products like Smart Trio yeah. and N Boost that you wanted to mention. So can you talk to us about your use with those? Well, um, if you're, one cool thing that Brant did, and they were one of the first to come to the market that I'm aware of, that when you're using the different technology to control weeds, you know, a lot of people are f familiar with Ingenia and Extend. Now, one cool thing is the Smart Quattro is labeled to be a tank mix partner. So that's nice to be able to throw it in while you're going. We've all seen the yellow flash when we throw Roundup in and we see the manganese deficiencies. But, but the Smart Trio for us, um, where we don't use, obviously, the, the Extend technology, um, we are putting the, B, the, the Smart uh, trio out there to help prevent that yellow flash from happening and it does a very good job. So Brian, can you talk to us about this Smart Trio? What is it in a little more detail and why does it work? So Smart Trio is a zinc and manganese combination with a little bit of boron and molly and the timing, well there's multiple timings, but usually the original timing is with the herbicide and the V timing when you're spraying that. The zinc in there really helps with the stress mitigation. Manganese is important for chlorophyll production. Uh, we also see a lot of stress reduction from the herbicide stresses that are put on there. Um, but the other really good timing is to put it with the Smart BMO at R3. That's kind of a key timing for a lot of guys in, okay. in those products. And then how about the N-Boost? How about the timing on that? So N-Boost is really interesting. It kind of depends on the nitrogen cycle. I like to start it during the R timings, depending on how aggressive you are. But when you do N-Boost, what we're seeing is better assimilation of nitrogen. Uh, so really starting from the R timings all the way through. Can you give us a background of what InBoost is and how it got started? Yeah, so InBoost is a biological product, um, and it really came out of pasture management um, process where they were trying to use less nitrogen, and when they put InBoost out, they were getting the same results. What we found was that the plants assimilate nitrogen better when they did it, so it had a great fit for egg, and in soybeans, that's a big deal. And you'll see your tissue test bump up when you make that application. Well, so far tonight, we've covered many of the inputs that have gone into Randy's world record yield. But right after this, we want to talk a little about some of the data management and some of the technology that he's using as well. So we'll get to that next on Rural America Live. <laughs> 